Okay, so this means that I'm switching into English, and of course, if you have any questions, you just post them in Danish. That would be okay. Um, so I'm not 100% sure uh, whether this fits into uh, the curriculum as such. Uh, the intention was that we were going to have this lecture as the second lecture, but unfortunately I wasn't able to make it last week. So it's sort of a little bit out of tune with uh, what you have been uh, looking at uh, last week. So we're, we're sort of stepping one step back. Uh, so what you should imagine now is that you've just been discussing the evolution of the nervous system, now we're talking about the development of the nervous system, which is what happens to the nervous system during a lifespan, basically. Um, so what I'm going to talk about during this next hour is basically how uh, the nervous system is uh, established, how it develops uh, before birth and right after birth, and then how it sort of goes downhill. Uh, later on. Um, so basically, the sequence of events that you have right there. Uh, so the nervous system is um, established around the 17th day um, uh, of pregnancy and develops then relatively quickly uh, during the next uh, couple of months. Uh, so basically, uh, after 20 weeks, if you just calculate the brain weight, it's about 100 grams. Around birth, it's uh, four times as much, 400 grams. But I think the main communication that I have here is that this is relatively little as compared to the final size of the brain. So uh, it still more than triples its weight uh, during Ah, when are you an adult? Great question. <laughs> uh, that, that's really a perfect question in this relation. Uh, the, from the brain point of view, when it has the um, weight uh, that uh, it eventually has as an adult, is around 15, 16 years of age, which is not necessarily what we would call an adult, but at least a youth. Uh, but that's around the time where you, you see that weight. Uh, that there are some uh, explanations for how it ends up having the weight uh, that it does. It's, of course, related to the sheer growth of uh, the number of neurons, which is the most important thing. It's not like when you're very small that your neurons are necessarily much smaller than they are when you're an adult. So the main reason why the brain increases its weight is that the, there are more neurons being developed, uh, but it's also that the connections, of course, grow. So uh, if you're two meters high, you have to have a longer accent, at least, uh, than if you're just one meter. Uh, but the cell bodies, as such, do not really change very much. Uh, another very important part of the increase in the weight of the brain is uh, all the things in the brain which are not neurons, which means essentially all the glia cells, etc., which also increase in number and increase in size and uh, contributes to, to the weight increase. Uh, but coming back to around birth, it's uh, about 400 grams, which is relatively much. Uh, so this is more or less the size of uh, what you would see in an average chimpanzee. Uh, so already at birth, we, we basically have a brain which is the same size as, uh, as an adult chimpanzee. Uh, this is uh, a problem, you could say, because uh, this is the main reason why it's relatively painful uh, to uh, give birth uh, when, when you're a human. Uh, all animals give birth without any major problems. Uh, very seldom are the births complicated, uh, very, well, rarely uh, is there any pain related to giving birth among uh, other animals. But in humans, it's a huge problem. The main reason why it's a problem is that we have to compromise two different things. One is that uh, we have this big brain, which means that the head is relatively big, 
which is a problem if you only have a certain amount of space available in order to uh, give birth to this uh, huge head. Uh, the other constraint uh, is that uh, during development we have uh, chosen to walk on two legs. Uh, and this is a huge problem because if, if you look at the comparison here between uh, chimpanzee, some of our human ancestors and modern humans, what you see basically is that the uh, pelvis becomes more and more narrow so that we can have the legs closer and closer to each other. And this is important in order to have an efficient gait, which has to do with also uh, survival of uh, the fittest, etc. This is simply a good way of having efficient bipedal walking, whereas you can afford to have these much wider apart if, if you're walking uh, uh, on four legs. The problem then is that when you make the distance between the legs and especially the femur uh, much smaller, it also means that it compromises the birth canal. Uh, so it's really a struggle between what is the best, looking at it from an evolutionary point of view, uh, can we afford to have a big brain, because that compromises how large the distance is between uh, the two legs. So one of the solutions has basically been to uh, delay the time that the brain is fully maturated until much later. So uh, children are born with an immature brain. Uh, all our other animals basically uh, are born with a fully mature brain and are able to walk and run around and function quite well already from birth. Uh, that's sensible because if you're whatever deer, gazelle, antelope, whatever, uh, you need to be able to walk very soon, otherwise you will get eaten by whatever lion is uh, out there. In humans, the parents will take care of you for a number of years, uh, so it's not as much of a problem uh, what that is concerned. So therefore it's delayed. Uh, so, we're not really sure when we should say that the brain is fully matured because there are different criteria that you can put there. You could say the number of neurons or you could say uh, myelinization, efficiency in the brain or whatever. It's still open. There are some who will say that uh, the brain never stops maturating and uh, that it's an ongoing process until the time that we die. Uh, during the last couple of days, there's been uh, several people in the radio saying that uh, at the age of 25, uh, the brain is not fully matured yet, and this is the reason why young men uh, make accidents when they're driving a car, because their brain is not fully matured. Uh, this may all be, but the problem is we, we don't really have a strict criterion for when to say that the brain is fully matured. There, there are different criteria we can put in. I'm, I'm coming back to that. At least what we do know is that at birth it's definitely not uh, mature. And this is also where the, the knee injuries in handball comes into it because it turns out that uh, women get much more frequently uh, knee injuries uh, when playing handball. The main reason for this is that women are simply not fit to play handball. And this is not a, an attempt to make a sexist claim or anything, but it's just the way it is. It's this compromise between having to give birth to a baby with a large brain, which sort of pulls the leg too, legs too far away from each other, which means that the angle that is necessary in order to uh, still have functional bipedal gait becomes too large, which means that Essentially, when you have force applied uh, to this leg, they're not fully aligned. So the angle in uh, women is simply larger uh, than in men. Uh, the angle uh, from, from the pelvis to the knees here is simply bigger because the, the birth canal has to be bigger. And therefore, because of that angle, it's more easy to uh, uh, get knee injuries um, playing handball. Uh, so that there is actually a, a quite clear evolutionary reason for it. So it's simply our large brains which are the explanation of 
knee injuries in uh, handball. I think that's fascinating to think about. Why only handball? Well, it's not only handball. It's any type of uh, uh, sport, really, which involves you having to apply a lot of force on to your knee joint, basically. It also happens in football, but in Denmark it's especially a problem in uh, handball because you have several movements where you have to change direction very often, and uh, this is where it's... And, and it's also a little bit more... Uh, uh, well, I, sh I shouldn't say violent game, but at least it's a little bit more physical than, for instance, football in terms of uh, near body contact and that sort of thing. So there, there are several situations where you don't have fully control of your legs necessarily, mainly because one of the other players uh, pushes you or whatever, and therefore you uh, do not uh, uh, activate the muscles sufficiently in order to protect the knee joint. Uh,